Universidad Nacional de la Amazonia Peruana, Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia, and Universidad Nacional San Agustina Erequipa. My apologies for my pronunciation. Um, and then the second part of the presentation will be uh, introduced by Josiane Kenfak, uh, who is uh, um, doing her PhD, and she's connected to the Universi University um, of uh, Yaoundé. So we want to dedicate uh, today's community talk to uh, um, International Women's Day that took place on March 8. And so that's why we're very excited to take time to dig into a research that is uh, dedicated to women. Um, so uh, Sandra and Josiane will first give a presentation. Uh, and then afterwards, there will be room for questions of the audience. Um, but if throughout the presentation, you already have questions or remarks uh, or something to add, feel free to do so in the chat. And uh, we promise to come back to that uh, afterwards. So I um, hope you will enjoy these sessions and uh, I'll give the floor to you, Sandra. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, good. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, okay. Okay, thank you very much. I'm also really excited to, to present about our research of uh, our project named Laura. And this project, uh, the Flemish promoter of this project is Professor Sara Lever, and in Peru, Professor Viviana Cancino. And uh, I'm, I'm co-promoter here in Belgium, but uh, together with other professors from the uh, University of, of Antwerp that I will mention in the next slides. So I'm going to start my presentation by giving you a brief introduction about vaginal, the vaginal microbiome and, the, the, and in relation to female health. Also, I'm going to talk about the ISALA project that started in Belgium. And, uh, and then I will continue with uh, the Laura project and the ISALA sisterhood. So first of all, uh, some background knowledge that uh, I want to let you know that you all, and me and all of us, we are uh, living in a deep connection uh, with microbes. These microbes uh, live in, in our body and on our body, and they reside in the gut, in the skin, in the respiratory tract. Uh, just to mention some, some examples, but also in the urogenital tract. And in my presentation, I will focus on, specifically in the vagina. So, how does it look like? How is uh, the vaginal um, niche? So uh, this is the vag vaginal epithelium. So that is covered with, with the mucus. And in this surface lives uh, a lot of uh, microbes that are uh, uh, living in interaction with the host and also interacting between them. And uh, in uh, under a balanced condition, uh, there are no problems, no symptoms, but sometimes when uh, women, um, when there is an imbalance, so for example, the proliferation of some specific uh, bacteria that produces compounds that degrade the mucus and also the epithelium of the, of the vagina, then it generates uh, an inflammatory response. And this is known as, uh, or this one of these conditions that are known, uh, it, it, it's named uh, bacterial vaginosis. And the, um, the, the symptomatology, it's that you feel vaginal, uh, this fishy odor, you also have vaginal discharge, and you have vaginal itching, and sometimes burning during urination. And uh, the, res the ongoing research uh, have, um, provided evidence saying that actually having bacterial vaginosis increased the risk that you, uh, if you are pregnant, that you uh, can deliver in preterm, preterm and also to acquire, uh, you are at higher risk of, acquire, of acquiring, acquiring HIV. And, um, but okay, we have a lot of microbes in our vagina and they live in, in, in equilibrium. 
but also we uh, already know that there are some factors that can influence this composition. So, uh, and here is a summary of the factors, for example, ethnicity, socioeconomic, socioeconomic status, the environment, dietary habits, of course, sexual activity, personal hygiene, and, um, and the contraceptive, contraceptive method that you are using. These are known uh, uh, factors that can influence the composition. So besides all this uh, ongoing research, there is, there is uh, still uh, research on women's health is still under study. And uh, most of the studies have been done in clinical settings. So there is this clinical bias. So there is a need to, 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 a better, to have a better reference of the normal microbiome. What is a normal microbiome? So this at this point, at the, in the, back in 2020, in our lab, we started the citizen science, the first citizen science project on vaginal health here in Belgium, uh, named Isala. The name was um, uh, was inspired on in Isala Van Dienst. She was the fe first female uh, doctor in Belgium, and actually at that time she couldn't study me medicine here because it was forbidden. She traveled to um, Switzerland to study, and then she came back, and finally she she became a, a doctor. So in this project in Isala, um, we had scientific goals and also societal goals. Among the scientific goals, of course, it was to map the female microbiome. So to study, we wanted to study not only the vaginal microbiome, but also from the skin and from the mouth, and to know if the presence of uh, lactobacilli, lactobacilli actually, this bacteria, it's a beneficial bacteria. So we wanted to know if it was present and also to map the, the potential factors that could uh, shape the vaginal microbiome. And um, among the societal goals, of course, it was to break the taboo, to bring, uh, the, the, to, to open the conversation on topics of vaginal health and to empower women and to stimulate co-creation and also to bring more women in science more in the picture. So here I'm going to explain briefly how was the workflow for Isala. So everything started with a lot of preparation, you know, brainstorm meetings, uh, also to prepare a good communication plan because this is a sensitive topic, investigating on the uh, vaginal energy or asking participants uh, to provide samples. Yeah, it's, it's quite, um, it's intimate. So we developed a, a good uh, communication plan with the help of a communication agency. So also a web page was created and a lot of uh, experimental optimization in the lab to, uh, to, to, to execute properly all the, all the experiments. So the project uh, was launched in March, 2020. And uh, I remember we were aiming for 200 participants. Also it was Corona at that time. And, uh, but actually after one week of open call in social media, in Instagram and Twitter, almost uh, 500, 5,000 women registered. So we had to stop registrations because each, processing each sample is expensive. So 5,000, yeah, it would be a lot. So, um, and of course, all uh, from the 5,000, not all of them um, participated at the end. Uh, it was it, around 3,400 women that participated in, in this phase of ISALA. So these participants, they also filled it in uh, an online questionnaire or survey where they, uh, they were asked about sexual habits, uh, social demographics, uh, dietary habits, and also um, to provide a sample. Uh, we send these kits, this uh, little box with two swaps. So the participant uh, self sample and, uh, and they uh, return the samples to the lab via B post. And this is the postal service. And then uh, one swap was um, kept for uh, to isolate bacteria. And the, the, the blue swap was used for to obtain actually the vaginal microbiome profile 
So in the lab, all the DNA was extracted and then everything passed as uh, 16S uh, RNA amplicon sequencing. And finally, we analyzed all, all the data. Oh, actually, not me, the experts in the group of bioinformaticians. And um, that was from the side of the wet lab, but also how to engage with the community. So for Isala, a web page was created where the participants and the society was informed about the status of the research, also to break taboos. Um, each member or of most of the members of the Isala team uh, wrote this um, uh, blog post. They were named conversation starters, uh, where we shared uh, personal um, stories on specific topics, for example, um, vaccination against HPV, or also uh, menstrual uh, menstruation, or um, a, here is another topic about fertility. So all the topics related to female health or, or sexual health that can open the conversation. And these were posted in the web page, and the, anyone can could um, post questions and they and we replied. So there was an interaction with the with the participants. So in the and the interaction was more more active, of, of course, via social media, via live stream sessions. For example, here is Sarah giving, I remember she was uh, showing all the participants, hey, hello, this is your sample, we are going to do this. So we really informed the participants on what was happening with their samples. So they really felt like they were close to us, they were part of this, um, of this project. Um, and of course, the project brought the, the attention of, of uh, the local um, media, uh, these are examples of the magazines that cover uh, all our research is Allah. And uh, well, and then after almost one year, the results came up and to the question, uh, um, what, what bacteria we found in, the, in, in these samples um, or how healthy are our vaginas or if there were, if they were dominated or, or, or not by lactobacilli. So the answer is yes, actually in this uh, graph, um, you can see here in the um, x-axis, the number of participants. So each participant is uh, a line and let's say, let's say we have like 3,500 lines together here. And, uh, and each line uh, depicts the, uh, for example, uh, in this region, this, this, let's say this line, this is a blue, it's blue, so it means that uh, this sample, con um, you find uh, Lactobacillus crispatus, but also that you also find uh, Lactobacillus inners. But as you can see, there is, a, there is a huge amount of samples that are dominated by Lactobacillus crispatus and other, uh, other, other, uh, other, other samples by Lactobacillus inners. These are the same results, but in a pie chart. So as you can see also again, Lactobacillus crispatus is the dominating um, species in, in a European population because all the samples were um, taken here in Belgium and specifically from Flanders, the north region of Belgium. And followed by uh, crispatus was followed by inners and by counting all the Lactobacilli, it was like 80 per, almost 80% of the population was uh, had a profile dominated by Lactobacilli taxa, as we call it. But also other uh, bacterial members are Garnerella and also uh, Prebotella. Mm -hmm. um, so these results were communicated to the participants. So each participant received uh, their personal profile. This is just an example. They, they, for example, this participant received a, okay, you, your dominant type is Lastobacillus crispatus, and you also have Prevotella in this percentage, no? So they, they knew that was for the participants. And, um, but also these results were communicated to the society via, uh, by giving an overview of the, of the results. And, uh, and as I told you before, okay, now we know in a European population, there are um, Lactobacillus is the dominating bacteria in, in the vaginal niche. But 
to the question, is really lactobacillus dominant also in other populations? So there was a study done in 2011 where, where um, they found that they studied the composition of the vaginal microbiome in different uh, populations, for example, in Asians, or what they call white, um, black, and Hispanic. This, was, this is a study from the United States and they used this classification. And um, as you can see, in, it is different. For example, in, a, in, in this population, uh, almost 45%, uh, most of them were dominated, where their profile was dominated by Lactobacillus crispatus. But for example, in a Hispanic population or, uh, or a black population, the composition is different. Crispatus is not a dominating profile, it's uh, the the number four, that is the, uh, that it's called the diversity, diversity group that it's known as the, the bacterial vaginosis profile. So it's, it's a mixed community, mostly dominated by anaerobic bacteria that are, that most studies associate these bacteria with negative health outcomes. So it's like not that good, but um, yeah, um, it's what they found. So, uh, for to the question, and then it raises the question. No, so is it really that all the um, all women have the same, or all women should have lactobacillus to be to be healthy? So then it's important to to study to make these studies, but but in different parts of, of 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 the world with different populations. So we decided to start Laura in Peru and also to follow to try in this project we try to follow uh, the citizen, a citizen science project approach but at that time we didn't have too much funding so we did the best that the, the best we could so um, we named our project Laura uh, and our inspiration was uh, uh, Laura Esther Rodriguez Dulanto, she was also the first uh, medical doctor in Peru. She also passed a lot of, um, uh, she had to overcome a lot of uh, problems to become a doctor and to, um, to really um, help their society by being a doctor. And um, this project was, um, we worked in collaboration with a uh, Universidad Nacional de la, de la Amazonia Peruana in the Amazon. This is the map of, of Peru. So here in the city is uh, Iquitos and the other uh, institution was the Instituto de Medicina Tropical Alexander von Humboldt in Lima in the coastal region. Uh, but at the same time, we also had a parallel project with, uh, with another university in the south, UMSA, and this is uh, the highlands. So in Peru, we have three really contrasting regions, the coast, the highlands, and the Amazon. Um, and the aim of Laura was to gain insights on the diversity of, uh, of what it means, a healthy microbiome, and, um, and if there was an influence of ethnicity. And, um, and also to build capacities on bioinformatics and data analysis applied to female uh, microbiome research. So the methodology we followed was um, to uh, recruit uh, uh, 50 women in each, in each city. So these women also received uh, a kit to self sample, similar as was done in, in Isala. But uh, of course, we, have, we had to adapt um, here in Belgium, uh, the postal service um, works well, let's say, but in Peru is not the case. So uh, in this case, we worked with uh, community health workers or field workers to deliver uh, the kits to the participants and to bring the samples to, to the lab. So the participants provided two swabs that uh, in, the, in the lab in Peru, uh, the DNA was extracted and then the samples were sent to here, to Belgium. And here we did all uh, the bioinformatic uh, analysis and also when the participants provided the samples at the same time, they also filled in a, a questionnaire um, with several questions on sociodemographics diet. Um, most of the questions were uh, similar as the questionnaire in, 
in Isala so that uh, we are able to, to compare results. And um, of course, by implementing Laura at the beginning, there were a lot of challenges. The first one was to work during the pandemics. So as you can see in the pictures, everyone was wearing masks, but um, that didn't prevent us to, to execute the project. So there was a lot of uh, initial meetings to disseminate the project um, among the authorities of the, for example, in Iquitos, the samples were, um, were taken in a, in a, in a primary health care center from women that were uh, going not for, for a gynecological cons consultation, but for um, going together, for example, with uh, the mother or the sister. And so it was a person that was not going, that was not feeling sick and that this person considered itself of being in a good health status. And um, also, uh, and then, of course, here uh, you see um, the team members in Quitos, Professor Viviana, Marco, and Katy. They are assembling the, the kids. And in Lima, Berta and Luz, they are also assembling the kids. And they were uh, doing this in, in parallel in both, both cities. And um, uh, then uh, when recruiting, for example, here is uh, in the picture, you can see Marco, he's explaining individually uh, to each participant. And using uh, here a tablet, showing a video so that the participant um, uh, was trained, let's say, on how to self-sample properly. No, to they had to wash their hands, um, removing jewelry, and and also in the video, it's it's shown how to um, open swab and all, all the so all the instructions to to self sample for self self sampling, and um. And also uh, one lesson learned, for example, is that in Lima we have a, a good internet connection, so the survey could was filled online, that was okay. But in Quitos we had to switch to a paper-based uh, version because yeah, when it rains, the internet sometimes just goes, and so it was safer to work on paper-based version. And about the results. Uh, maybe you remember this graph from the left from Isala that almost 55% of the samples were dominated by Lactobacillus crispatus and Lactobacillus seniors. What we found in Laura was that it's almost 50% of the samples were dominated by Lactobacillus, also Lactobacillus, but um, the most uh, prevalent, digamos, uh, say, let's say, <laughs> It, uh, it was lactobacillus inners. Um, it was present in 27% of the, of the participants as a dominant um, uh, species, followed by Prevotella and Crispatus. So here we see the first difference you know, that we have in a, in a uh, Peruvian population, the dominant profiles are uh, it's lactobacillus inners and not lactobacillus crispatus, but uh, and also the the um, the dominance is is less compared to to an, uh, to an European population. We are currently doing more analysis, so also we are writing the article. So so as soon as we have more results, we all we will also um, share it via social media. So stay tuned. And um, concerning uh, the results of the survey, um, a, most of the participants, they, con uh, they were in a self-reported good health status. So almost 85%, they reported their self as having a good health condition. And compared to, to, the, to uh, the Belgian population where the pill is the, was, is the, the most common, com uh, contraceptive method. In Peru, it's not the case. So in Peru, 30% of women were not didn't use any method and 20, 27% used the injections that last almost three months, 12% the condom and 8% uh, and the coitus interruptus and 5% the, the pill. So here is also a really contrasting difference that the pill is, is less used in, in Peru compared to, to Belgium. 
Then we, uh, here I'm sharing just a few questions of the, that, were, that are interesting to share with you. For example, we asked the participants if they suffered from, vagin suffered from vaginal infections during pregnancy, and 50% of them say yes, and almost 90% of them said that the infection they had was a urine urinary tract infection. And, uh, and uh, yeah, we also asked them, what do you do when you have a complaint? Do you go to the doctor? What do you do? Well, in both cities, actually, almost the same percentage, 40%, they replied that they go to, to a pharmacy and they buy medication without prescription, which is not good because this increased the problem of antibiotic resistance. Most of the time they, they buy antibiotics and this is a problem that the Peruvian government is trying to counteract, but yeah, there are still, uh, there's still a lot of work to do. And 30% um, and, um, of the participants replied that they go to the doctor and a few percentage they prefer to use natural remedies or just they just wait until the symptoms disappear. And finally, we ask the participants, okay, uh, if they will be, if they will, they are, they were willing to participate in a, in a future study, and 99% of them say yes, they were really uh, happy and motivated to, to participate, to know more about vaginal health, and so here I, I uh, copied some of the comments we received uh, because at the end of the, the questionnaire they. They, there was a comment section. So some of them said that you please share the results in a clear way or others said, okay, you have, you need to ask less questions and others were happy to participate, to contribute to know more about women's health. And, and yeah, and some of course were apparently were having a lot of uh, problems because for example, this person, uh, she wants to know why is she having these strong infections because every time she has she, she needs to, to get these antibiotics via intramuscular so probably yeah I think the problem is related to, with antibiotic resistance this is about Laura and uh, about the main results let's say but we also uh, have some uh, lesson learned learn uh, that we compile them together to apply for a bigger funding and that will explain later. So we had these interviews with the, um, with the field workers and they told us that were a lot of challenges, but the, the ones I'll mention, the first one was to explain these new terms to the participants, the terms of microbi microbiome, the bacteria you have, and how a bacteria can impact your health. And yeah, all these new concepts were, was really a challenge to explain to the participants. And also mm, they had to face some, some issues with some family members of the participants because they didn't want them to participate actually. Some, in some cases was the mother, in other cases the partner. Um, yeah, and also, yeah, since it's a, uh, we had, we really had a lot of delays, not only because of the pandemics, but also uh, because of signing of contracts and also to bring in, bring in the sample from Peru to Belgium is not just sending the samples, you have to sign these MTA documents and that passed through several offices that were delaying a lot. So. We had to explain these delays to the participants because they were asking to, to Luz and to Berta, when are you going to deliver the results? So, but we keep them updated on, on the stages of, of their research. So with all those lessons learned during Laura, we decided to apply for a bigger funding to, uh, to continue our study. So Laura, the first phase was a cross-sectional study, but now we are going to execute, uh, we are executing actually a Laura, but this will be a longitudinal study. And the aim of Laura 2.0 actually is to empower women living in Peru by providing them ev evidence-based knowledge on vaginal health, and also to strengthen uh, research capacities in, in Peruvian universities. 
So Laura brings together several institutions. And the first one is Univers the University of Antwerp, and not only um, members of the Faculty of Science, uh, but also members of the Faculty of Medicine. So we are interacting between faculties. And from the Faculty of Medicine, we are working with Professor Veronique Verhoeven and Professor Nelle Brusselars. And, um, and of course, uh, all the ISALA members are supporting Laura. Um, in Peru, uh, three, uh, two public universities are involved in app, led by Professor uh, 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 Viviana Pinedo. And in, in the south, in the highlands, University Nacional San Agustin de Arequipa, the, P, the PI is the Professor Ada del Carpio. And uh, again, we, uh, work, we are working with the Instituto Tropical of, uh, of Tropical Medicine, Alexander von Humboldt, where the PI is Professor Teresa Ochoa. And here are the names of all the team, team members. And also, um, we're, uh, we are also collaborating with Professor Magali Vilas. I will explain later about her project, Mamas de Rio. And uh, in Laura, we are aiming to, to recruit 100 participants in each region and to follow uh, the, um, the and to study the vaginal microbiome composition over two menstrual cycles. So this is one menstrual cycle and this is the, the, the second. So we'll take three samples for DNA uh, sequencing for the identification of the microbiome and a fourth sample to really isolate uh, bacteria. And the same will be repeated in the in the second phase, so it's a longitudinal study. And um, <clears throat> in Laura, we are also uh, doing capacity building activities. This started actually in, in Laura, and we're continuing this in this project. For example, last year we went to Peru to teach uh, all the microbiology and molecular biology techniques to the students involved in Laura to execute properly Laura this year. And also before going, we were also preparing um, some videos on training, uh, for example, for DNA extraction, we were recording ourselves in the lab showing how to do. So when we went to Peru, it was easier no, uh, to, to really perform the, the techniques. And uh, we also have, we have uh, created our social media accounts. So please follow us on Twitter where we are going, to, we are, uh, um, posting in English, and since Facebook is the most uh, used uh, social media platform in Peru, we will we are posting information there also, but in Spanish, and um, also we are working on assembling our advisory board, and uh, and we are going also to to launch a, a national survey on on female health. So uh, all this work is is ongoing. And as I mentioned before, to work in the in the Amazon, we are joining forces with another project led, led by Professor uh, Magali Blas. The name is Mamas de Rio. It's like Mothers of the River. So this project, in, in her project, they train actually actually people living in the communities. They train them to to become community health workers, so that they learn how to detect emergency emergency signs uh, during pregnancy, and they know how to react when they see that uh, there is an urgent need uh, for the mother or for the child. So they follow during pregnancy and also the postpartum period, because in these remote areas there are no hospitals or something close. So they they really be, they they are essential. So since they are working already with the community and they, they are engaged with them, we are joining forces to, to uh, disseminate our project and also to encourage women there to, to, to participate in our citizen science project. And uh, now I'm going to explain about the Isala Sisterhood because Laura is the first sister project of Isala. Let's say Isala is the big sister, the one that started here in Belgium. And, um, but actually during all this time, we were contacted by researchers around the world so that they can, they wanted also to, to start a project similar to Isala. So in this context, uh, we have already, uh, we are working with, uh, for example, 
with the following presenter, Josiane, with Cameroon. And uh, also uh, here is an example of the visit recently uh, to researcher from Imperial College London. They wanted to know about, about Laura, how was executed in Peru. And they uh, visited, actually they went to Peru, they visit, uh, visited the communities and they uh, gather old experience from the community work workers so that they can uh, yeah, enrich their experience and to, to use it because they want to work in, in, in collaboration with Uganda. And um, yeah, that, what I wanted to explain first was that, okay, do we, since several researchers were uh, contacted us, we have developed this ISALA international framework guidelines. Actually, these are the communication guidelines that we have used during ISALA and all um, also uh, could be complemented also with experience in, in, in Laura. And um, so in these guidelines are, the, are all the approach for the citizen science uh, project execution. So we share this with the, with the partners that want to work with us so that they can adapt this content to their local reality so that they can start executing their own citizen science project. And with this, I want to finish my, present, finish my presentation. And um, here in this uh, map, I show the potential sister projects we have and the sister projects we have. We already have projects with Cameroon, UK, uh, Spain. We also apply for funding together with Morocco. And each sister project have a different focus, research focus. So not all, not all of them are investigating the same. Some of them focus, for example, on the effect of um, these uh, cleaning products for the vagina. Others are focusing on HPV uh, and uh, uh, others are focusing. Yeah, there are so many topics to investigate. So uh, this is how the picture looks like for now. So with this, I want to end my presentation and to acknowledge all the partners in, in Peru that made uh, Laura possible. And yeah, thank you. And now I give the floor to Josiane. Hello from Cameroon. Thank you very much, Sandra, for your amazing presentation. Let me share my screen. Okay. Good afternoon from Cameroon. I would like first to thank you for the increased opportunities you offered me to present our project, the host liquid project inspired by Izala. Started by general microbiota and Cameroonian women health, mapping and increasing awareness. The promoter is Professor Sarah Liber, and in Cameroon is Dr. Esmo Livo and I. So, my presentation will be followed. I will first talk about the background, then I will present the, I will make the discussion of the host related project, and I will talk about methodology. As we all know, the, the vaginal microbiome is a set of microorganisms present in the vagina. These microorganisms participate in the herd. The composition of the vaginal microbiome varies according to diet, environmental factors, immunology status, and even ethnicity. According to Ravel et al. 2012, Vaginal microbiome is classified into five community state types. This classification strongly depending on whether we are Caucasian, we are Asia, Asian, we are Hispanic, or we are African. The healthy vaginal microbiome is dominated by lactobacillus species, especially lactobacillus crispatus. When the balance of the vaginal microbiome is disturbed by the presence of anaerobic bacteria such as Gardella vaginalis, the vaginal environment of the woman is vulnerable. 
So the woman is predisposed to certain diseases such as HIV, chlamydia. In fact, the vaginal microbiome is the key of human health, even those around her, like children and men. Unfortunately, based to our knowledge, vaginal microbiome data is not available in many parts in Africa, especially in Cameroon. Since we don't know the vaginal composition of the healthy woman, it is there's a critical knowledge gap in the field of vaginal health. Before we make a project, we want to address this gap. Up to now, we don't have a, a knowledge of how the vaginal of Cameroon women is. We don't have any base. So with this project, we want to first radically increase our insight on the diversity of a healthy vaginal microbiome composition and uncover the influence of ethnicity and other lifestyle and environmental factors. Then you also have awareness about vaginal health. That is very taboo in Cameroon and also in many um, African countries. We have awareness about vaginal health and healthy practice among women in our society. The project is called Rosileke Project. Rosileke is a Cameroonian Emeritus Professor of Immunology and Parasitology. She has contributed a lot to the research of pregnancy associated with malaria. She was also honored as a heroine of health by women in global health and general electric health care. So how the project will be implemented in Cameroon? The project will be implemented in Cameroon in two different zones, the rural, that is the north region of Cameroon. The central, that is a, um, the urban field in Cameroon. We will work with women from healthy women. We will, we will retreat. The project has not, uh, we are not beginning uh, collection. We will begin with 30 healthy women, rural women, then 13 healthy urban women. So after uh, recruitment of the women, we first begin by determining the bacteria vaginosis of the of the woman according to the protocol described by, by Amsel, by Amsel and Nugenskom. So after determining the, 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 the bacteria vaginosis, we will then proceed by determination by the mapping of vaginal microbiome. We use first in a swap then extra DNA, then sequencing, and through bioinformatic analysis, we, we quantify the, we identify the population that we, we have in this in the vaginal microbiome. We also use ESWAP to lactobacillus isolation. Another point that is important in our project is the, the community plan. So we have awareness about vaginal health through family discussion educating women and uh, young girls. The sensibilization will be, then, will be then also done at the level of women association, healthcare and in social media. One thing we want to also do in Cameroon, do in Cameroon is that we want to involve men in the process because um, unfortunately in some regions of Cameroon, women don't have the power of decision. The man is the head of the family and we decide about everything. So it's important to involve men in the process so that they can support their wife in taking charge or uh, taking their health in charge. So that is um, an, an overview of how the project will be implemented in Cameroon. Uh, we, we normally we will begin this um, this month because we have first begin by half all administrative procedure, that is ethical clearance, um, all protocol. So very soon we will have uh, all results. So thank you very much for your, your great, your kind attention. Thank you both Sandra and Josiane for uh, 
both the presentations, which were very, uh, very interesting. We didn't know what to expect exactly in the beginning, but uh, <laughs> at least on my part, it was super, super interesting. And in the chat as well, I saw a lot of congratulations addressed to Laura, but Laura is a project, so I saw <laughs> it addressed to Sandra and Josiane. Um, but uh, so we still have 10 minutes uh, for a Q&A. Um, let me maybe start with a question that was raised in the chat. Um, and it was raised during the presentation of Sandra. So I think maybe uh, it's rather for you. Um, and the question is, um, you showed in the presentation that for the um, group in uh, Peru, there was more diversity. Um, and the question is, is that a, is that a good thing? <laughs> we are starting to understand this. We uh, first, uh, sh I think, yeah, should be because we are not all the same. And uh, also uh, the samples were taken from women that didn't have any vaginal complaint. So yeah, actually we still need to investigate more, but yeah, good. It, it was also interesting to see that Lactobacillus is still present, so and with mixed communities, and also it's important to know that not um, because this was a transversal study. This, this is a study. It, this is the community that you have at that specific time point, but this you don't you the vaginal microbiome is dynamic. You can switch from Crispatus to Garnerella to to different uh, dominating bacteria. So uh, yeah. We are just starting to understand this. I, I, I can't say it's good or bad, but since they were taken from healthy women, yeah, could be good. Yeah. But <laughs> this is still open. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's I think that's a very clear um, answer. Another question, uh, interesting, I think, is um how do you think this, that this research will benefit upgrading uh, the body and knowledge in this area of specialization, especially because it's a citizen science, science approach? Does this change the perception for, for people, perception of their bodies? Ah, yes, yes. Because, um, for example, in Laura, women were really interested to, to know what they can do to have a good vaginal health, to, to not have this complaint. So for them to know more about the microorganisms and to know more, yeah, it will definitely empower them and help them to understand better, yeah. Okay, great. Are there some questions from the audience? So if so, don't hesitate to put your uh, camera on and to raise the question directly to Sandra, Josiane, or both. Is there no, are there no questions from the audience? Can, can I maybe ask a question? <laughs> um, so since it was an open call for women, that's how I understood to provide a sample, like did you see if um, there was some kind of, features that came back, maybe uh, a level of education, uh, the age, uh, like were there some features like women for who it was easier to provide a sample than for other women? Uh, for example, in, in Isala, uh, yeah, there is this kind of, uh, when you study the social demographics and check all this uh, data, for example, the profile of the Isala participant was a highly educated woman with a, a high uh, socioeconomic status. So there is still a lot of uh, work to do to reach vulnerable populations or, um, for example, there was a master thesis on studying why Isala didn't reach these uh, communities uh, no, for uh, or, uh, foreign communities, let's say, living in Belgium with different ethnicities. And uh, there, there were um, several key factors identified. The first one, for example, was um, that there was not an intermediate person, a trusted person, for example, uh, that we, for example, we use that in Peru. In Peru, there were the community workers, there were the ones that were in contact with the participants. So um, I think the, 
yeah, there are, there are some, um, as, uh, as in your question, no, there, there are some specific characteristics that came up in, during SADA. Okay, in meanwhile, <clears throat> more questions were raised. Um, one is, um, well, one is maybe linked to previous question, how, um, I know it's actually addressed to both of you, I assume, how uh, your perception of the female body has changed. I leave the floor to Josiani because I was <laughs> talking too much. <laughs> yes, any okay. <laughs> okay, um, my perception changed because I learned a lot. I have a lot of information. Um, before I began this project, I didn't know that my vagina was very important. The vagina is capital for the human health. The vagina is important con um, as this is concerned. For example, they study that proof that when you, are, you have a disuse of your vagina, you have 16% chance to increase HIV infection. There is not only for you as, as a woman, the vagina also influences you as a, a woman who gives birth to your children. When a woman is um, have a disease of a uh, vagina, they, they are more affected by what we call maternal and fetal outcome, miscarriage, low birth, and also. The vagina also intervenes with a, a man. So when you, if your vagina is not healthy, you, 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 you can easily transmit disease to your partner. So be in this project and learn, by, I know that how my vagina is important, influence me a lot. I am, I am sure that I am not, um, I know this, I am not alone. If each woman have this information, the team will change. I think that's a very nice answer. Alexa, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, and then uh, there's a question for Josiane uh, specifically. Um, are there other uh, distinct or other geographical regions you would like to explore in Cameroon for your next steps? Yes, of course. We have this particular in Cameroon that you have four different regions. The region is different according to lifestyle, alimentation, and all. And we also know that the vaginal microbiome is greatly um, influenced by the environment. We will oh, no, unfortunately. In North Cameroon and Ufta. We say? Oh, sorry. The connection was interrupted for a while. Sorry. Continue, please. Okay. As I was saying, Cameroon have this, this particular idea that we have four different regions, different at all, different in lifestyle, different in mentality, different in um, eating habit, habit. And we also know that vaginal microbiome is influenced by all this diversity. So with the beginning, we begin to work in central region and in North Cameroon. Then after we uh, explore vaginal microbiome in East, that is a, a very big region, very different East Cameroon and Western Cameroon. Okay, I think that's also a very, Clear answer. Um, there are two uh, left. We will address these two uh, before ending. Uh, the first um, one, um, besides the involvement of academic uh, institutions, are there other institutions in Peru related to publish, public health in, involved in the research? I assume that's a question. Yeah. Um... Yeah, in Peru, besides uh, yeah, the universities, we are collaborating with NGOs uh, mm -hmm. to disseminate uh, the results of the, of, the, of the study. Also with uh, members of the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of, uh, of uh, it's called the Ministry of Women and Vulnerable Populations. So they are yeah, different, different partners, not only academic partners, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I think we came to the last question, uh, which is, um, um, yeah, if um, data of the hygiene status of participants uh, were included. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, yeah, actually, because 
since uh, Josiane is part of the, the study mm -hmm. of Josiane, is, 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 uh, the study in Cameroon is part of the sisterhood of Olsi Sala, we use uh, the, the same questionnaire. Yeah, we include uh, questions on hygiene status and uh, dietary habits. And yes, yeah. all of them were, were included. Yeah. OK, great. Um, we reached the end um, of the community talk. It's three o'clock now uh, in Brussels. Um, I would like to thank the audience for your presence, for your questions, for your attendancy. Uh, we really like you being uh, present, so, so uh, thank you for that. And also special thank to uh, Josiane and Sandra. Uh, congratulations on this very interesting and much needed uh, project. And also good luck with uh, the future research. Keep up the good work. Um, and we hope to welcome you for the next um, next community talk that will be dedicated to um, climate health, which is a research on how climate change, migration, and health uh, interact. So, if available, don't hesitate to register and to join us next month. Um, you will find this presentation uh, and a video later on our website. So. If you find it interesting and you would like to share it with uh, with peers, with colleagues, friends, uh, don't hesitate to do so. Um, and voila, um, enjoy the rest of the day and I hope to see you soon again. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you bye. very much. Thank bye. you. Take bye. Care. <laughs>